Okay, yeah, uh, the you know, traffic, I, I was backed up on traffic coming down here myself. Uh, so, well, we will do what we're going to do. And uh, actually, because of the nature of the class, I think it's a very important one. Um, first of all, we uh, this week, uh, we finished the book of Exodus by Yaakel Pekudek. There are two Torah portions that are read together. <clears throat> We have uh, on a leap year, as this one is, right? This is a leap year. We have the extra month. So we have to have extra uh, portions to read on this on the various extra Shabbatot. Now, theoretically, we have four extra Shabbat, Shabbos. I mean, that's a problem. Though. How do you really pluralize the word Shabbat? <laughs> Sabbaths is easy. That you get away with. Shabbatot, you can get away with. Shabbosim, if you're an Ashkenazi speaker. Right? It was like uh, I was talking with somebody else. And you can't say good Shabbat or, or uh, you won't say Shabbos Shalom. You know, there's just the things that don't work out. All right. But anyway, so there could be, in theory, four Shabbatot that aren't accounted for. So if you have a certain number of uh, Torah readings that are doubled up on most times, then when you have a leap year, you now have the ability to uh, divide those into two Torah portions for Yaakil Pekude, which is going to be this weekend. Uh, yeah, it's doubled this year, isn't it? I'm making these statements and I don't even, I didn't look at the calendar, but I'm pretty sure it's doubled up, even though it is a leap year. Let me double check. Thank goodness in the world for uh, all these wonderful devices that we have, huh? Calendars, money, Shabbos. What is Shabbos? Let's see. Right there. It's too near with that, but let's see. Eight, ten, eleven, minute. I can look at my uh, calendar. I've done that on occasion. I think I remember everything, and then I say, wait a minute, I didn't remember everything. Yeah. Hebrew date. Shabbos Shkalim is this weekend. All right. Yeah, uh, Vayakel. So this year it's divided. I was talking as if they were the same. This coming Shabbat, we'll have Vayakel. Mm -hmm. And it's also, remember, we talked a few weeks ago. Now, the special Shabbat leading up through the month of Adar before Passover. So this coming Shabbat is Shabbat Parsha Shekalim. That's always read the Shabbat before Rosh Chodesh Adar, Adar or before Adar Bet, second Adar. And that talks about the uh, uh, census of uh, Israelite males, which we actually read about last week. So we're repeating part of what we read last week. Okay. All right. Uh, and then we've revived Yaakel the next week. Okay. And so uh, and what these really are, the, these two portions are kind of summary, summarizing what's taking place uh, about the, the construction of the Mishkan. Uh, Moshe summons everybody, and before he goes through all the details, uh, he uh, reminds them to observe the Shabbat. And uh, I heard an interesting uh Sermonette, as they would, you know, would say in English, talking about how the, we're talking about making the Mishkan, putting together the Mishkan, the tabernacle. So what does that have to do with Shabbat? Because most of the times we think about Shabbat, we think about things we don't do, things we're not making, not doing. And so as he pointed out, no, there's also we have to make Shabbat. We have to do things to make it into Shabbat. Uh, and that means you have to prepare in advance. You want to make it a nice Shabbat. You want to make it a nice meal. You have So therefore, you have to go to the store and buy what you're going to need for that Shabbat. Uh, interesting, in, in, they talk about in uh, some of the older rabbinic literature about buying your groceries on Friday. So as you know, you're buying it for Shabbat. You know, today's world, uh, most of the grocery stores are too crowded on Friday. But uh, and we've got refrigeration and all of that. So maybe we can start preparing for Shabbat earlier. But the, the idea is you are preparing for Shabbat. You're building Shabbat. 
Right? So it is an action that is related to the story of the tabernacle because you're going to build the tabernacle, gather all the things you need for it in advance as well before you construct it. So before Shabbat, you have to construct it. All right, uh, the uh, major uh, information I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, oh, good. There you come in uh, the right time. We're going to talk about life. We're going to start into the life cycles. There are going to be three sessions. This one, in which will then be interrupted by uh, uh, talking about uh, Passover. But you have rituals of, of birth early life. You have rituals of marriage and divorce, and there are rituals surrounding death. And in every culture, every religion, the moments of major transformations uh, or major uh, transformations uh, another word I'm thinking, I'm looking for and not finding at the moment uh, require or demand some kind of reaction to it. Yeah. So every religion has something to do, some kind of ceremony recognizing birth. Almost every religion has some kind of ceremony recognizing uh, the the child be beginning to become an adult, the onset of puberty and moving into to that. Has some kind of recognition of a, a man and a woman traditionally coming together to create a, a family, a home, a uh, marriage, uh, and something to deal with the end of life. All right? So all of these milestones almost demand you do something. You know, it, it's like you've got to have something to recognize. You don't. You can't just let it go by. Yeah. Uh, so the, the Judaism, through from the Torah and from uh, later practices and things, uh, recognize each one of the, these three major, er, er, you know, the, these areas. Not just three: birth, education, entrance into to, to puberty in mitzvot. Uh, marriage, uh, and having children, uh, and and the end of life. So, uh, first of all, uh, it's been in the news a lot, and uh, we've talked a little bit about it, we touched upon it. Uh, uh, the first mitzvah given to human beings is what? Shabbat. Nope. Oh. We mentioned before, be, right, to have children. Be fruitful and multiply. Pur uh, urvu. You know, as a, a biological need. Uh, so uh, that, of course, will tie in. We'll talk about it more when we talk about marriage. But bringing a child into this world, educating a child in this world, uh, is considered to be one of the major functions of human beings. Mm -hmm. If nothing else, to make sure that we got somebody to take care of us in our old age, right? Uh, by the way, there's there's a lot of truth to how cultures have seen that. You know, that, that children uh, are expected to uh, care for their parents when they get old, not the nursing homes. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes you have no choice in that matter. After trying, you have to remind me to tell. There's a story about a rabbi. Who had to run away from his mother? We'll have to get back to that. We talk about aging and death. Yes, I am. Thank you. I I did hit it. Yeah. Yeah, it's recording. It's recording. No. Um, you know, that's how I messed it up last time. I checked to see it was recording, and I think it turned it off. Is what happened last time. That time when I messed it up. Okay. So, uh. With the news in the States recently about the issue of uh, IVF, uh, intra, I don't know, it's just, 
fertilization, in vitro in fertilization, vitro. in vitro fertilization. That was the word I was trying to think of. I knew it stand, stood for something. I couldn't remember what it was. Exactly. Test two babies, as we used to, as it originally was called. Okay. Uh, and if you uh, like your literature, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World already talks about that many moons ago. Um, you know, uh, when this first came into being, uh, the the first question that came up uh, was artificial insemination by a donor, uh, which was originally known as AIDS, right? which life has a way of changing things. So the discussion in that area uh, was how to regard that, assuming that you know, at that stage of the game, what we were talking about was collecting sperm from a man and then in some way inseminating a woman uh, because there was a problem with the husband uh, fathering a child. So the, the question that was examined and, and went different ways was, what is the nature of the donor of that that sperm? Is it, and, and when you do it, is that an act of adultery? And it was a big to-do about it. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, the preeminent Orthodox uh, decisors of Jewish law, Posek, uh, this was back in the 40s, I think it was, or maybe 50s, uh, came out and discussed it. Uh, and basing himself on uh, non-science science. The ancients believed that it was possible for a woman to get pregnant if a man somehow has a discharge in the bath. You know, you know the man was in there first and the woman comes in later on and maybe something happened and somehow the semen got to her and she got impregnated. Um, and the fact that we know that that's impossible today doesn't change <clears throat> the statement that in regard to that, which is assumed that the child was not regarded as a mamzer, as an uh, illegitimate child uh, from a, uh, uh, an act of adultery. And so for that, on the basis of that, Ramosha Feinstein wanted to permit artificial insemination by a donor. His only caveat was it should be a non-Jewish donor. Why? Uh, because if it were a Jewish donor, there's a greater possibility of the child marrying a child from the donor and then uh, from a, with another person, another woman, maybe his own wife, you know, what have you. But if the donor was, was a non-Jewish donor, then the likelihood it was much smaller. He was taken to task by a lot of, of his Orthodox colleagues for that. But it, uh, when we reach the stage and we're talking about in vitro fertilization, which we're no longer talking about uh, the necessarily the donor being someone outside of the uh, couple, uh, became much more acceptable. How can you change where you are? I'm sorry? Is somebody talking to me? Sorry for that. My son was talking. Oh, okay. <laughs> Say hello to your son for me. All right. So anyway, <clears throat> that was uh, found greater acceptability. The issue often was how do you collect the sperm? And then because uh, traditional, all traditional circles frowned on, on, on masturbation. And some say it's not really because you're doing it for that purpose. And therefore, it's not uh, seed going to waste, what have you. But it was much more acceptable. Now, the status of the uh, embryos, which is what I'm really trying to get down to, at least my understanding is most Jewish authorities do not regard that as being a human being yet. Certainly the first 30 days after, after uh, conception was understood as being uh, not really there yet, in a sense. Uh, so that, for example, uh, we'll come to uh, firstborn sons in a few minutes. But, if, for example, if a woman would have a miscarriage within the first 30 to 40, 50 days, 
after conception, it was considered to be irrelevant to the status of the next child. Okay? It's considered just water. We know there's, there's just a few cells that have reached that stage. Uh, they are potential life, but so is the ovum in the woman before she menstruates. Uh, so uh, I don't think most Jewish authorities would agree with the Alabama Supreme Court decision that, that these fetus, not, they're not even fetuses, they're embryos, that they have the status of a human being as a human child yet. We'll talk again. We'll talk about marriage next. The next time we'll talk a little bit more about that and and the relations of men, men and women and, and all of that area. Okay, but it was on my mind now, so I thought we'd touch about. It. Okay. So God willing, we bring a child into the world. Uh, if it's a boy, uh, you know the old joke goes, "What do you call a Jewish child that doesn't have a circumcision?" A girl. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, until re re relatively recent, it, 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 that really was completely the, the story, right? That Jewish males were circumcised, even if uh, they weren't always in non-religious circles circumcised by a moel on the eighth day, which we'll come to in a minute, they were circumcised. And, and uh, nowadays there's, there's often fights back and forth about the whole issue. For the Jewish world, the traditional Jewish world, 99% of the Jewish world, circumcision of male children is an obligation. Whether one believes it's an obligation from God, it's an obligation from the people of Israel, it's an obligation of what is part of that Jewish identification, the circumcision was there. Now, in Hebrew, we actually don't call it circumcision. There's a word for circumcision is milah. Right? The circumciser, the person who does it, is called a moab. He's right, to remove the foreskin. But it's called brit mila. Right? Or uh, you'll hear people saying, especially uh, they're going to, to a bris. The bris, bris is the first half of the statement. Bris means or brit covenant of mila circumcision. So it's really a brit mila. It's not merely a medical procedure. It is a ritual procedure. Uh, and we first read about it when before the birth of Isaac, when God speaks to Avraham, he tells him that he has to be circumcised and all of his household have to be circumcised. And we read in a number of those places that uh, not only there, that it's the eighth day. From then on, every male child that is born in Israel is to be circumcised on the eighth day. Now, if you do your math, if a child is born on Shabbat, when is the Brit Milah going to take place? One day after Shabbat. Nope. Shabbat. The day you are born, a week later, that day is the day of the Brit Milah. That's the eighth day. If you're born on Monday, you're born on Monday, the eighth day is Monday. Right? And that is a case where the Brit Milah overrides Shabbat. Because Brit Milah is a, a, a surgical procedure. It's a wounding. Let's, and that's how the rabbis refer to any kind of cut. The cutting is a wounding. You're not allowed to wound on Shabbat. If you want to have some kind of uh, non-life-threatening uh, circumstances for a surgery, you don't do it on Shabbat. Okay? Now you, if you have to have a mole removed, you don't remove a mole on Shabbat. If a child's time to be circumcised is Brit Milah is for on Shabbat, you have the Brit Milah at least at the outset, ideally on Shabbat. That includes even if it were to occur in such a way that would fall on Yom Kippur. Brit Milah 
overrides these other rituals, Shabbat, Yom Kippur, etc. There may be certain uh, aspects that didn't get uh, defined. The question of how do you get the the uh, knife to where the child is when there's no uh, aim, or you can't do that, you can't carry it in the public thoroughfare. There's discussions about ways around it, perhaps in the Talmud, but that be that as it may, the the necessary aspects that must take place for the Brit Milah to occur. And the rabbis talk about warming water, to have hot water for the to warm the child up in the course of the procedure. Uh, you can boil water on Shabbat for the child. Okay. So that's number one. Number two, the child, though, is the most important thing here. If there's any reason to lead you to believe that it would be dangerous for the child to have the Brit Milah on the eighth day, then we delay it. We have to. So a very common issue is jaundice. I think today most doctors would say it's not really a problem, but Jewish tradition saw it as a problem. And a, if a baby is, a male baby is jaundiced, then we do not do the Brit Milah on Shabbat. And of course, if there's other, you know, anything more serious or other issues around the health of the child, that it overrides the need to have it on the eighth day. Unfortunately, in the modern world, where people are often scattered in different places, what sometimes we run into is the issue of whether or not a moyo can, is available to do it where you live. If you live in uh, uh, Saskatoon, well, Saskatoon may have a well fly, no, Yellowknife, or even if you live in Richmond Hill, you may not be able to get a moil there on Shabbat, in which case, uh, ideally, we'd try to arrange for it, but uh, the reality is often that the Brit Milah will then take place on Sunday. If the Brit Milah is delayed for some reason, Sorry, go on. Welcome. If the Brit Milah is delayed for some reason, then we don't do it on a Shabbat or a Yom Tov. Because okay? once it's no longer on the day it is supposed to take place, then we delay it to the first opportunity. We always want to do it as soon as possible. Can't be done at night, so it should be done as soon as possible in the morning. Whatever things can be arranged. So, of course, the, really, the reality is all day long. My son, because of various reasons, he was born the, on Pesach. His Brit Milah was the day after Pesach. Can't find somebody to cater and, and, and also the moil that was available the day after Pesach. So his was at noontime. But, I, but originally, it was almost always performed during the morning service at the synagogue. And it, that influenced certain aspects of the ritual. Now, since... The Brit Milah is on Shabbat only if the child is born on Shabbat. That means if there is any kind of doubt that comes to play. For example, late Friday afternoon, and it's at, right at sunset time. Sun's about to set. I, any of you who have been in the delivery room know, or you watch on TV when they, God forbid, talk about the death. When they look at their watch, that's what the time is. Time of death was 12.02. Well, he's been dead for three minutes, but that's when they look at the watch. Your baby was born a minute after midnight. My firstborn was born a minute after midnight. I don't know where he's really born a minute after midnight. I didn't have a stopwatch to, to check the timing there. And since it was the second night of Pesach, so it was another issue altogether for me. But all right. How do you know for sure the child is born before sunset or after sunset? You're right at that time. What we call Benash Mashot, the, the, the twilight time, the twilight zone. Since there's a level of doubt, the Brit Milah would not take place on Shabbat. You can't do it on Friday, even though the doubt says maybe the child was actually born on Friday, but there's a lot of doubt there. So you can't do it on Friday because of the doubt. 
Can't do it on Shabbat Saturday because of the doubt. When can you do it? Sunday. Similarly, at the end of Shabbat, Saturday night, it's sun is setting. When do the three stars come out? Different opinions on that as well. How do you know if it's still Shabbat or not? If it were still Shabbat, the Brit Milah would take place on Shabbat. If it's no longer Shabbat, the Brit Milah cannot take place on Shabbat. So there's some doubt. Is it Saturday or Sunday? So now it's Sunday. Another issue is cesarean. If a woman is in labor and the doctor that delivers the baby on Shabbat by cesarean, that's not a natural delivery. Now, it may have been necessary. You know, God forbid that we're questioning the doctors delivering the baby when the doctor feels it's necessary. Although there are a lot, a higher number of C sections on uh, towards the weekend, so the doctors can go play golf. They don't tell you that, but there seems to be some cor well, correspondence between the things. Okay. Um, but still, theoretically, had the 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 uh, uh, birth process had extended, it might have gone on before, you know, let's say Friday, right towards Shabbat. Uh, then there's a little bit of, uh, if it's on Friday, then you would probably have the Brit Meal on Friday. But if the Brit, if the circumcision takes place on, I mean, sorry, if the C-section, cesarean section takes place on Shabbat, then there's question about whether or not the baby really would have been born on Shabbat, and then will be delayed again to the next day. Uh, the the other question is, is sometimes when uh, the doctors uh, will uh, try to you know, add uh, pitocin, you know, is that the word I'm thinking? And it was to speed up the uh, delivery. Oxytocin. Uh, no, no, that's uh, oxy um, is a uh, painkiller. Pain yeah. Pitocin is. Uh, How's that? Um, and to induce labor. Pitocin, oh, no, isn't still it? Still oxytocin. No, not oxycontin, oxytocin. Oxytocin? Pretty sure. Sure. Maybe I. <laughs> I just did it a few years ago. I'm pretty sure, yeah. I'm probably not. Yeah, you know better than I. I, mean, I don't know. I've never <laughs> given, I've <laughs> never, never given birth. Yeah, you too, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, so uh, oxytocin. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. All right. But the name of oxycotton. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah, okay. yeah. So anyway, the the uh if it's right near there's some questions. One of my colleagues, a good friend of mine, says you do it anyway. If the baby's born on Shabbat, uh, I have my miss yeah, uh uh misgivings on whether or not he's correct in his assumption, but that's all right. So in any case. The uh, the birth of a son, everything healthy, everything okay, the Brit Milah takes place on Shabbat, if it's born on Shabbat. It takes place on the eighth day, as long as the child is healthy and there's no other kinds of things getting in the way. And we know that, you know, we mentioned it when we talked about Hanukkah, that it was a tradition that Jews were very strong about that women, especially, we read about women giving up their life make sure, because they wanted to have their son circumcised. And it was one of the things mentioned in the books of Maccabees uh, that uh, Jewish women were killed for circumcising their sons, no matter what day of the week. Um, now, we really don't have a comparable ceremony traditionally for the birth of a daughter. Uh, when uh, uh, we have, uh, there have been attempts in the modern era, especially in, even in some modern Orthodox circles, to have some kind of ceremony marking the birth of a daughter. Nothing has become the rigor accepted ceremony. Maybe in a couple hundred years, there will be something that, is, that has finally taken full head in the Jewish community. Uh, but uh, it, 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 there really is not anything as of yet that matches that kind of what's going on around the Brit Milah. 
because you, you know, you, you, first of all, I, ideally you have a minion present. You can have Brit Milah without a minion, but you, ideally you have a, a minion present. Uh, and there's a whole ceremony uh, surrounding it. The baby is brought into the room. Everybody welcomes the child, Baruch Haba, uh, the Moel, uh, who should be a religious Jew, traditionally only males, but there is room for saying a woman could serve as a, a, a Moelet. Again, in Orthodox circles in general, they would have frowned upon it. Uh, but we we know, for example, in the story of, of Moshe, when he's coming back, yeah. that Sipora circumcises her son. So it is certainly permissible whether or not it's it's you know it's it would be mutter you know, uh, although maybe you want to say you can't do it in some circles. My only caveat is that the the moral should be a religious Jew, okay? so, uh, observer of the Shabbat. I've never come across a female circumciser moelit who meets that criteria. There are reformed women who do it, and I'm sure there are conservative women perhaps who do it. I don't, and I haven't met one to, that I could say they are not Shomer Shabbat, so I don't know. But uh, generally speaking, we look to somebody who's Shomer Shabbat. Um, so the Moel today, most Moelim, not all, but an overwhelming majority are doctors. It has more to do with insurance than anything else. Uh, and the way of the circumcision uh, that is performed by somebody who's doing it in accordance with Jewish tradition is often very different from the way doctors perform circumcisions in the hospital. Uh, just briefly, what is necessary is that the foreskin is moved up, uh, pulled forward, so it's over the corona, uh, the end, the very end of the penis. Some kind of uh, shield is then attached that cover uh you the old way was just a piece of metal with a slit in it in different sizes depending upon this nature of the child that would hold the foreskin from fo coming back and then some kind of sharp instrument to cut the foreskin uh and i know it's um trying not to go into too, too great i've yeah. literally been there holding my children with it. yeah and it was pretty rough well usually you don't have, you don't look right? right i don't know it was bad yeah two boys <laughs> yeah two boys it's tough for us it what? was tough for me yes <laughs> yeah the mother usually suffers more than the child does for sure yeah uh does it is there great pain in the child i think that's still a, a subject of debate i've been to many a brit mila uh, and I've heard the child fetching, crying when they take the diaper off. Mm -hmm. right? And um, there seems to be no greater difference between that crying and the crying that takes place when the moil is doing what he's doing. Uh, some will say there is. Today, a lot of moilim, uh, especially more liberal moilim, will apply uh, uh, anesthetic uh, emolin. I think it's called, uh, to the area that deadens the nerve endings so that makes it a lot easier for the child. Uh, and usually what you do is you take a, a gauze and wrap it up and you dip it in the wine and all oh, your sweet wine because kids of that age are not going to go for a good Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, and, he, he, you know, the father's told, keep giving it to him and, you know, and he sucks on it and that takes, you know, takes care of it. The moil who's going to perform the Brit Milah does it as the agent, the shliach of the father. And many a moil will say, okay, the baby's ready. It's up to you now to circumcise. Or do you want me to do it? And most of the time, the fathers are very happy to have the moil do it. Uh, and so he will say a bracha. Uh, uh, command is concerning the mila, the circumcision, and as soon as he's fin finished that, one, two, three, and the father when says uh, another bracha. To uh, bring him into the covenant of Abraham, our father. Uh, we have the cup of wine there. That not just for the baby to have a little sip, 
uh, because we ha then have blessings that are recited and the baby is traditionally named at that time, their Hebrew name. Um, and the usually the Moyle says a uh, blessing for the healing of the mother and the child. And then, you know, we've, we got together. We all might as well get something to eat while we're here. Uh, and so a festive meal, the, the su'uda, is considered to be part of the Brit Mila, the idea that you celebrate, because this is an important uh, aspect of a child's life. So that for girls, obviously, we don't want to do anything physically like any nature of that uh, with a, a female child. Uh, but uh, sometimes it's it's uh, uh, there are some ceremonies that have been created. Sometimes what they do is they wait until uh, mother and child can come to the synagogue. And so they come to the synagogue and then the father is given an aliyah. To, oh, or in those synagogues where women also have aliyah to the Torah, the women mother with the father or whatever the case, whatever the circumstances may be, which are all many different circumstances today's world. Um, uh, the, during the, uh, at the end of the reading of the Torah, the, the, uh, person who's called up for the Aliyah says the bracha, the blessing that follows. We read that the other day. And then there's a special Misha Beirach, special prayer, which is said, which then bestows the name on the, uh, the daughter. So this, a male child traditionally is named at part, as part of the Brit Milah. A girl, a female child can be named any time the Torah is read. As I said, a lot of places, especially more liberal circles, they wait until the mother and child can come to the synagogue and participate and celebrate and, uh, uh, together with family and friends that way. So that kind of make it uh, a, a little more substantial, welcoming the, the daughter into this world. Uh, Now, the naming is important. Jewish tradition regards names as having significance. Th throughout the Bible, names are very clearly significant. And whether or not post or uh, pre, the names say something about what the future of the person is going to be. That's how it's it's viewed in, in, in the, the Bible in any case. Um, and it's been certainly a practice probably over 2,000 years to have both a Hebrew name and a secular name. We, we see this clearly uh, amongst uh, the Maccabees. They had both Hebrew and Greek names. Uh, and the custom varies depending upon the nature of the individuals uh, to whether or not the two names have anything in common. Is it? Uh, to cite an example, I didn't go over his philosophy, but Spinoza, in, in well, not in English, but in his, his secular name was Benedict or Benedictus. I'm not sure how it was at that time, which means blessing. And his Hebrew name was Baruch. Okay. Uh, and so it's very common for people to have a, a name that meant the same as their Hebrew name for their secular name that would be used outside of, of uh, ritual purposes or outside the family. Uh, Ashkenazic tradition is that we do not name a child after a living relative. It's a very strong tradition to name after a deceased relative, but it's a very strong tradition not to name them after a living relative. It's probably more related to superstition than anything else. When the Malach HaMavit, the angel of death, comes along, uh, you want to make sure he gets the right Menachem, not Menachem, the, the young, but Menachem, the old. And if grandpa's name is Menachem, and, and uh, or, 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 my, my grandfather was Baruch Shmuel ben Tzvi My father name was Tzvi Zaev. He was named after his grandfather who was no longer alive. Let us say my father decided to name me Baruch Shmuel. I'm Baruch Shmuel. My grandfather is Baruch Shmuel. We don't want the Malach, we don't want the Malach Mavid coming after me and, and get, uh, after my grandfather and getting me instead. <laughs> okay. 
But we know that that was not the custom clearly in Sephardic circles. Not only that, we have evidence that in the Mishnahic times, the early uh, few centuries, it's very clear that they often named after a living relative. We have a whole series of Shimon ben Gamliel, who was succeeded by his son Gamliel ben Shimon, who was succeeded by his son Shimon ben Gamliel. And I don't think every case was one where grandfather had died already. Uh, and, and so in Sephardic circles, it is a strong custom that the first male child is named after the paternal grandfather. So I'll tell you a cute story. When I was a rabbi in El Paso, Texas, I had in my community people who were of Sephardic background. It was our ancestry. And uh, she was pregnant and knew that it was going to be a boy. And they came to me and uh, said, you know, Rabbi, which is far And I said, yeah, I'm aware of that. And we name after the paternal grandfather. I said, yeah, I know. That's perfectly legitimate. That's your tradition. I have no problems with that. That's your, your custom. Uh, and uh, so uh, his father's name was Morris. And the grandfather's name is Morris, and he was name is Moshe. So what do I assume? I said, uh, you don't want to name him Morris. Morris is not a, a very, well, this is a few years ago already, but still not a very modern name. And they said, no, 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 Rabbi, we're okay with Morris. We don't like Moshe. <laughs> so I said, you can do what you want to do. Yeah, that's obvious. They named him Morris. I don't know what the Hebrew name was. So they, but it was an M. You'll hear people say, Rabbi, my father was Harry which was my father's name. Can we name our my son uh, uh, Heschel? That's the Yiddish for Harold. Yeah, you can name him Heschel. Or his Heschel, can we name him Svi? Svi is the Hebrew uh, version of it, which a lot of people have adopted using the Hebrew rather than the Yiddish. But they will say, well, my father's name, my, we want to name him after Avraham. Can we name him, name him Adam? We want to, you know, the same letter. What am I going to say? You can't. You can do whatever you want. There's no rule that you have to follow. Uh, I have a nephew through marriage whose English name is Adam and his Hebrew name is Zachariah. Okay? Now, he know, now he's known as Zachariah. He goes by the Hebrew name Zachariah, not by Adam anymore. Madhav Shah. But, you know, so people come to me and ask me about names when I was in the pulpit all the time. And I have, I have a couple of name dictionaries at home and uh, you know, look things up to see what they can find equivalents of the same letter or the, what have you, or the same meaning. Uh, those who are converting traditionally have to pick a Hebrew name. And you talk to your sponsoring rabbi how you want about go about doing it, if it's related to your English name or if it's a name you just like, or you pick it out of the hat. Uh, that all those are all possibilities. Uh, although traditionally, uh, a person who converts to Judaism is automatically known as the son or daughter of Abraham. Or in more liberal circles, they'll say Abraham and Sarah. There used to be a time when the uh, converts were always named Abraham and, and female converts were always named Sarah, but that's not an ironclad rule either. But if you see Abraham ben Abraham, usually you knew that was a somebody converted to Judaism. All right. Now, there's one other thing that often is is not well known in not uh, in less religious Jewish circles, and that is what is called pidyon haben. Uh, we are told right after the Exodus, you know, uh, the last plague in Egypt was the killing of the firstborn, and we are to told in, in the Torah that the firstborn has a special status. Firstborn animals were be given uh, uh, to Kohanim. And if it was in a good, normal state, in the way it should be, it was brought to Jerusalem, blood was put on the altar, and the coin could, could have it. Or when it went bad, then the coin could have it without having to go through it. Um, so too, the firstborn Jewish male is what male animals firstborn, male humans firstborn. But the Torah speaks of peter rechem. Peter rechem means opening of the womb. 
So in order to have what we call a pidyon haben, or when you are required to have a pidyon haben, is really the way to put it, is if your first, uh, the woman, her first born child is her first, certainly term pregnancy, or at least past about, uh, uh, bef- uh, if any other pregnancy was earlier than three months, uh, it doesn't count uh, as a pregnancy, but any it has to be firstborn male child born naturally. So a cesarean does not count. So when you have, uh, have a male child, and that male child is the first child, and that first child is the woman's first child, and that first child is the petarech, the, the, all right, and all of those things come, then but on the 30th day after birth, because in the ancient world, 30 days was considered to be very um, touch and go. Child mortality rates were so high in the ancient world. Th- uh, the child who survived 30 days meant that they uh, had the confidence the child was going to at least survive for a period of time. So after 30 days, we have what is called the Pidona Ben, the redemption of the sun. Five silver coins, originally five shekels. The father go, gets a kohen, and he offers five shekels for that child to the kohen as a pidyon. Doesn't mean the kohen can run off with the child, yeah? but uh, there's a ceremony in which the, the the kohen says, "What would you rather have, the money or the child?" You, the mother saying to the father, you better say. <laughs> uh, now, uh, it, it has to be a silver coin of the, of the, I'll use the ancient word, realm. So if you have silver Canadian coins, dollar loonies, which we don't have today, we do have. Well, I'm oh, very special. Yeah. I don't know what the. I don't know I'm out. I don't know the silver content. They have to be a real a certain amount of silver. Okay. Yes. So if that then that would qualify. I didn't have a pity on the band. My mother had a miscarriage, uh, right at three months, because I was born on the first anniversary. So it better have been at three months in those days. All right. Um. But my. Uh, Second, my oldest son had a pidyon ben for his son, and my youngest did. For my youngest, I have I had silver dollars, real U.S. silver dollars, and I gave them to my son to for the for the for the uh, pidyon. And Rabbi Karab can bless him. He took them, and he said, "Okay, you in you want the back? All right, let's see how much they're really worth." So my son had to pay more than six dollars to get those coins back. <laughs> well, no, he didn't give them back. He yeah, sold them. He yeah. sold them back to my son, oh, and they're I, they're all. I, know, we got, I made a thing out of them on the wall of their house. Okay. The one, the one was eighteen seventy eight, I think. Wow, or seventy two. What in that neighborhood? <laughs> they were all old silver coins. They were old. So they can for... sell it back to you, right? So you don't have oh, to. Oh, no, no. It, exactly. it belongs to the Kohen. It belongs to the Kohen. It's his. He does with it what he wants. He wants to go buy a loaf of bread with it. He can buy a loaf of bread with it. If he wants to sell it, he can sell it. And so he just happened to have somebody who was willing to buy it after they looked up online and had an idea of approximately how much the coin was worth. I think actually my son got a deal out of that, but. Uh... Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's nice. All right. Now, uh, a custom that is followed and has become more popular in the uh, in recent years is that for male sons they don't cut their hair till after their third birthday. There's actually no basis for that in Jewish tradition. It's become a, it's a modern. It comes out of Hasidic circles. It has entered into Ashkenazic circles. Uh, all of my grandsons. Had an ufshir, and my sons did not. They call him Yiddish an uh, So after their third birthday, you make a party, and you get your first haircut. 
And depending upon the child, it's no big deal. And depending on the child, it's a real screaming contest. You know, it's like the first going to the barbershop. Uh, again, you celebrate with, with that. And also, it's considered to be an introduction to their education. So oftentimes, there will be some kind of action you may have. Uh, used to be, they would have a board. And they would outline, write the letters in, in uh, uh, honey on this board or plate. And they would say, this is an olive. And they had the child lick the olive. And this is a bet. They have a child lick the bet. Uh, today, you can put candy instead. So you put a candy on the, the olive or what have you. And the child gets to eat a lot of candy that way. Um, and... Uh, then you know from then on it's a boy, not a girl. I, some of my grand says, Oh, what a cute girl. It's not a girl, it's a boy. But some have oh, gorgeous hair they sometimes have. Oh, wow. Well. Like <laughs> the ladies would kill for it. <laughs> uh, in the Middle Ages, we know, at least for a period of time in Ashkenazic circles, they made a real big to do around the age of five. When they have a big ceremony with it, when the boys at least, the girls, it depended upon the community and what kind of education they got, which was not always the same. Most of the time it wasn't. Um, to do a big to do, whoop de do around the age of five, and they would be introduced to to uh, school at that point in time. Uh, that really disappeared. We don't know <clears throat> what was done in terms of bar mitzvah. Uh, it existed. But whether or not it was really celebrated, we don't, and it may be that the, the celebration of the bar mitzvah kind of pushed this tradition to the side. It only lasted for 150 years or something like that in Ashkenazic circles. I don't know there was anything uh, like it in Sephardic circles. But um, we have to understand that uh, or was, before I come to bar mitzvah, we, I mentioned in passing about education. Uh, one of the important elements of raising a child in Jewish tradition is giving them an education, uh, both in Torah and in how to make and earn a living. The Talmud makes very clear that you're supposed to teach your child a trade. Again, most of the time talking about boys, women in those days sometimes had trades, but for the most part, they didn't. Uh, although we do read of, of women being involved in business. Uh, but the idea was you should not depend upon Torah uh, for your livelihood, but you should have some way of earning income. Talmud makes that very clear. And... Uh, only a very few in various times in history, great scholars might have been supported by the community. But in general, people were expected to earn a living. And all of the rabbis in the Talmud all earned a livelihood. Some were very poor. And they talk about that. But all were expected to earn a livelihood. So to teach a livelihood as well as teaching Torah. And uh, in most of Jewish history, at least the men and oftentimes the women were able to read and write. Maybe it was only the Hebrew and or the Yiddish. And later on, often just, you know, but they knew, knew how to read the Torah. They learned, knew how to read uh, uh, a basic Chumash uh, throughout most of Jewish history. Again, women depends. Sometimes women were highly educated. Sometimes their education was ignored and varied from time to time in community. Today, thank God, that's no longer the case in most Jewish communities. Um, so going to school, entering school, learning, learning is a part and parcel of it. Now, bar and bat mitzvah has nothing to do with that per se. Although most synagogues use it, especially in non-Orthodox circles, as the uh, uh, carrot uh, and stick approach. The carrot was the bar mitzvah ceremony Shabbos morning in the synagogue. The stick was they had to go to Hebrew school. All right. um, but the real meaning of bar and bat mitzvah has nothing to do with what every, I'm sure you think it does. 
if you are a girl and you're entering puberty, you are a bat mitzvah. What does that mean? Most girls, when they start to enter puberty, begin to have a couple of pubic hairs. If a woman has two pubic hairs, she's a woman in that sense. She's an adult. Bat mitzvah in that sense means she is now subject to the mitzvot. For a boy, since boys normally enter puberty at a later stage, usually closer to 13, same rule, two pubic hairs was sufficient. Uh, they were considered to be a bar mitzvah, which is the, the Aramaic, ben and is the Hebrew. It means someone who is subject to the mitzvah. That's what it means. We don't go around checking people today. So normally we assume by 12 for girls and by 13 for boys, they've reached that stage. And they celebrate their coming of age. You, uh, uh, I repeat this constantly. You do not need to do anything whatsoever to be a bat mitzvah or a bar mitzvah. You just have to have a birthday. You don't even have to have a birthday party. You don't have to have the cake and the candles. None of that. <laughs> ah, my birth certificate says I was born on the on the fourth day of Adar. Fourth day of Adar, I'm a bar mitzvah. End of story. Now, since this is a very important milestone in, in life, people celebrate it. Again, boys got more of uh, uh, of the cake part. We know the girls too; they it was celebrated, but not necessarily as much. And as time went on, you know, how do you know your? How do we know for a male that you've reached the age of mitzvot? That you are equal in terms of most things dealing with the mitzvot of the Torah. You do something that an adult does. You're called up to the Torah for an aliyah. All you, you know, the earliest thing was, all right, so you're 13, tell you what, you'll go to shul next week. Not next week, not tomorrow. Today's your birthday. This, you know, tonight, tomorrow's your birthday. We take, you know, we've already been practicing putting on your tefillin, waiting for this day. And tomorrow is Monday. So we'll go to shul, you put on your tefillin, you'll get called up to the Torah, you'll have an aliyah, maybe you'll have a shot of schnapps and a thistle of herring, and we'll celebrate. Okay. Yeah, you know, that's not such a big deal. So maybe we'll do it on Shabbos. So we'll have two pieces of herring. And we'll have some cake, and everybody else will get a little cake and a little bit of herring and, and some schnapps. Well, you want to, maybe you'll read from the Torah. You're a bright kid, you'll learn your Torah portion, you'll read from the Torah. You're not up to that. Maybe you'll read the Haftarah, we'll give you the last Aliyah, which really, technically, you don't even have to be a bar mitzvah for, but all right. You'll have the, the uh, extra aliyah, the mafter aliyah. You'll read from the haftarah, and we'll have a, two pieces, three pieces of he, uh, of herring and, and and some shops. You're really good. You'll read from the Torah. You'll read from the haftarah. Maybe you'll chant Musaf. You'll do shacharit. You'll even give a darash. You'll give a uh, Torah study to everybody, and we'll have four pieces of herring and. Uh, <laughs> In, and and um, as time went by, it became more and more of the celebration and less of the mitzvah. Or as uh, is once quipped, more of the bar and less of the mitzvah. Uh, girls did not have any public things. And the, we know that in, in, in North America, uh, the first public, not uh, at least that we know of, of celebrating of a bat mitzvah was was uh, you know, we'll call it combining in later uh, Mordechai Kaplan's daughter at uh, uh, the congregation that he had created uh, celebrated her bat mitzvah. 
I don't know if it was at 12 or 13. Many synagogues delay it for girls to 13, in part to keep them in school, the same way they went to the boys going to Hebrew school until that age. Uh, in Orthodox circles, there is generally not a public kind of thing like that. There are some that will, they will do some kind of group gathering. Oftentimes, the girls will, will join together to do something. They may learn, teach something. They may learn passages from Bible, from Talmud, Mishnah. They may give, her, give a drash. But since in Orthodox circles, women don't participate in the synagogue service publicly, they don't. In more liberal communities, depending upon what they do, if women do everything the men do, then the, the girl will have a bar mitzvah just like the boy has a bar mitzvah. Um, and so it depends upon that community on, on what they do and how they, they do it. Uh, the reform movement, as part of its uh, changing or dealing with it, sought to do away with bar and bat mitzvah. They felt that, um, first of all, at 13, a child was not really old enough to, to be assuming uh, the res adult responsibilities in the community. They saw that in Christian circles, you had uh, confirmation ceremonies, especially in, in Catholic circles, that usually took place, say, 16 or so, something on the lines. And so they did away with bar and bat mitzvah and instead uh, celebrate for both boys and girls a confirmation ceremony. Today, most have gone back to having bar and bat mitzvah. They may have both. When I grew up in my conservative synagogue, we had both celebrate our bar mitzvah and we stayed around for more school for a few more years and we had a confirmation whoop de doo as a group. But all right, so these are all ways of celebrating the milestones in life the communities have their own way of, of dealing with them. Uh, it is a problem in the modern world. What has happened is, is that the concept of what bar and bat mitzvah was supposed to be is in many ways gone. Its origins is to say that the youngster has reached the age in which they are regarded as part of the adult community for mitzvot. Now, even then, they didn't necessarily have rights to certain things. They, they would not, you wouldn't appoint somebody as a judge, a dayan, until 20. Okay. Uh, but if you need a tenth for the minion, that boy was a tenth for the minion. If it's a minion counts women, the girl was a tenth for the, the minion. That's more modern because, believe me, up until recently, that one wasn't the case, even where they had celebrated bat mitzvahs. Um, but it's now has become a party. In many circles, that's all it is. I've dealt with that in, in the course of the years when I was a, a, a rabbi of a pulpit. Uh, it has become such a thing that... Uh, we hear of these obnoxious big whoop de doos that I don't know how I many thousands upon thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of dollars are spent on these whoop de doos and, and, and hiring fancy singers and, and all kinds of things like that. And how, uh, while Jews may envy their neighbor's Christmas and everything, uh, Jewish neighbors' kids envy the Jewish kids their bar and bat mitzvah parties. Uh, and want to have their own uh, in some way. And it's become uh, a reality, a reality in certain areas of the world where they essentially have a, a non-Jewish bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah, because they just have a 13th birthday. Hmm? But uh, that's not what it was supposed to be, and that's what it, it should not be. It... Um, and like I say, depending on the community and how they deal with it. Uh, all right. It's uh, early again, but uh, we covered the basic ground that I want to cover. I haven't really, really been working on the Hebrew. We really should do some more of that you know, upcoming. Uh, next week, I'll remind everyone, next week is the 13th. 
uh, and that's uh, the spring break. And I've, I know it didn't look like it on the uh, the sheet, and I realized that, that today that I didn't have that, that there was no class. I usually don't have class during spring break. Some families and things go away. People go away, have things. Uh, and on the 20th, we will be having the, the exam. I will give it to you in advance sometime between now and after the 13th, probably. And we will go over it online. I will be out of town, but we'll be able to go over it online and, and correct it that way. All right. And then we, when we come back, we'll start talking about Pesach. All right. Because uh, that's uh, around the corner. Okay. So next Shabbat, it, well, this Shabbat, we welcome the month of Adar Bet. Uh, and uh, that means we're almost to Purim. And Purim is, is a month before Pesach. Okay. Any questions? Oh, let me just, oh. Let me step back one thing. Uh, when it comes to Pidyon Aben, traditionally, if the mother was a convert, even if they met all the other criteria, traditionally the child would not have a Pidyon Aben. If either father or mother is of a descent from a Kohen or a Levite, a Levi, they're, they're their child doesn't have a pinyon of Ben. So if the father's a Kohen, the mother's a daughter of a Kohen, Bat Kohen, or the father is a Levi, or the mother's a Bat Levi, the daughter of a Levi, since they have certain prerogatives, their children don't have pinyon of Ben. I mean, pinyon of Ben is not a, a, a like you go. You want to have it in that sense. I mean, it's a strange, strange thing. Uh, if you don't need to have a pigeon on a bed, there's no need to go out and have a pigeon on a bed. It's not like, but I want to have one. Yeah, it's not, you don't need to. You don't. You want to. Pay, I want to pay my. But you got to. You you're exempt from paying taxes this year. No, no, no. I want to pay my taxes. <laughs> After you talk to the psychiatrist, come back and see me. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that's what the pigeon event is. It's a requirement of a child that meets all of the criteria. And if any of those criteria are not met, including the parents in some way, don't uh, either. Their children don't have it, or they they were not originally Jewish, and therefore their their descent is is out coming in not from in uh then uh they don't have a pinion event any questions out there in the what's that what what's this pinion event that's right i'm so confused with that oh the pinion event 30 <laughs> days after the birth okay we said that if 30 days after birth if the child is male uh -huh. it's the first born right there's been no miscarriages uh there it was a normal birth then you have the ceremonial pidyon habet you, you know five shekels are given to the kohen uh to redeem that's pidyon habet actually means redemption of the son okay we, we uh, the the torah seems to imply that before uh the golden calf episode uh the firstborn son of the families, and that probably was the ancient world, had priestly functions. Hmm. It probably was in the ancient world. Every family had somebody who acted as the priest for the family, and the firstborn son was the priest for the family. When the the after the golden calf episode, it was established you would have the Kohanim, the sons of Aaron, would serve as the priests. The sons of the the tribe of Levi would serve as the helpers to the Kohanim. And therefore, they took the place of the firstborn sons. Mm -hmm. But the firstborn sons still had that kind of an obligation. So we redeemed them from the Kohen. Just like if we have a firstborn sheep, uh, it had to be redeemed from the Kohen. Uh, or you gave it to the Kohen. Okay. Uh, so too with the child. We're not going to give the child to the Kohen, but they you would redeem them from the Kohen. Clarify some? Oh, yeah, I don't know. Mike, you just had the bris and the mikvah. So well, bec well, yeah. well, because first of all, you weren't Jewish. Right. So therefore, since their mother was not Jewish right. at their birth, there's no pity of the bed. Okay. 
but otherwise I've never even heard of anyone doing this. It's not as common. Because no. remember, yeah, all the criteria have to be there. I mean, I and also it depends on what circles you're in. Okay. If you're in Orthodox circles, yeah. then you'll hear about it all the time. Right. If you're not in Orthodox circles, then some people are not aware of it. We've never heard of it. Yeah. And and since and and if they're not aware of it, even if they met all the criteria, they sometimes don't have it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I know. So uh I'm in my synagogues yeah. over the course of the years, I didn't didn't have a lot of cases where their opinion had been, uh, but also because all the criteria have to be met, right? Yeah, but even though, like, I live in a very Jewish area, I know a lot of, I've never, you know, uh, but I guess it's just true, like, how, you know. You know, uh, if, if you have any Orthodox neighbors and people that you're friendly with, ask them about it, they'll tell you, oh, yeah, so-and-so yeah, had opinion I, I know. But it's not, but I'm not saying, it's, Everybody, all the boys have a beat me a lot. Everybody knows about that. Everybody has yeah, a beat me a lot. Yeah, 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 everybody knows about that. We've been at a ceremony. Yeah, and everybody has a bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah. Everybody, yeah. The yeah, everybody knows that. But some. Do you all have the mikvah, like dunking in the mikvah? Or is that only no, because like, my boys weren't Jewish? Well, their boys weren't Jewish, so right. they had to go to the mikvah. But uh, when we read about the giving of the Torah, in the Ten Commandments, we're told that they had to prepare themselves for the giving of the Torah. Mm -hmm. Which meant bathing, going to the mikvah. Mm -hmm. So everybody went to the mikvah before we got the Torah. So they went, they went to the mikvah, they accepted the Torah. The men had all been circumcised for the <clears throat> for Pesach. So there you have the conversion of everybody at that time. Okay. All right. Cool, sir. All right. Anybody else out there? Any questions? I don't see any hands waving. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I, I understand better what you were explaining uh, regarding. No, 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 no. I understood what you said now after my classmate uh, asked you a question. I was also confused. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, well, thank yeah, her for asking. Yeah, see, That's why I say you got to ask questions. You don't understand? Ask a question. Understand. Okay. Yes. All right, everybody. Have a good night. Yeah. Laila Tov Lekulam. Laila Tov Lekulam.